In our last video, we discussed why Christ was baptized, which was in fulfillment of the Levitical law regarding the preparation of legitimate sacrificial offerings. We also explored why John the Baptist baptized others in addition to Christ, a practice that was in fulfillment of another facet of that same group of laws found in Leviticus. Laws which required the washing of the priests. John the Baptist, his role in regards to cleansing the sons of Levi was a key prophecy made in relation to him in the book of Malachi. When we explore the prophecies of Malachi, the purpose of John the Baptist is made explicitly clear. Understanding the purpose and objectives of the baptism of John, we can now naturally explore the next topic of discussion. What is the context of baptism after the crucifixion? Why did the apostles baptize? Why did they stop? What does baptism represent in their epistles and what does it mean for us? Now, before we explore these things, we should first investigate the pragmatic nature of the word baptizo. During the original time of the apostles, this word did not have the mystical nature that the later so-called church applied to it. When a word is decidedly transliterated instead of translated, this allows the translator in question, and in this case for the KJV being the Anglican Church, it allows them to give the word a new definition. If you don't translate a word, the meaning of the word is not made clear for the reader. The meaning of the word can now mean anything. Transliterating the word baptizo into baptism, the church was able to give it a novel and ceremonially esoteric meaning. Much the same was accomplished through other words, for example, the insertion of the word Gentile into English translations, which is deliberately forceful and artificial, because the word is not even transliterated from any Greek manuscript because the word is Latin. To understand the word baptizo, we should investigate how it was read and understood by Christians at the time of Christ. In Greek, the meaning of the word is quite literal. It means immersion. And in the Greek language, the word was often used to describe the immersion into many different things, whether it be water or blood, fog, clouds, or otherwise. With that said, and with the definition made clear, we can see this meaning shine forth in the context of quite a few translations from our Bibles. One example would be when Paul told the Corinthians that their ancestors were immersed with Moses in the Red Sea. For those who are not acquainted with history, this may come across as a spiritual metaphor for baptism, but this is not the case. This was not a spiritual metaphor for anything, but a pragmatic reference to the fact that the ancestors of the Dorian Corinthians literally were immersed through the open sea when they traveled with Moses. Their ancestors were there. Those Corinthians which Paul spoke to were Israel according to the flesh, just as he calls them, along with the surrounding pagan nations later in that same chapter. 
in significant part. The people of Corinth in Paul's day were Dorian Greeks, descendants of Israelites from Dor in Manasseh, who had long ago, along with the Phoenicians, sailed to Crete and then thereafter to Greece. The Spartans were also Dorians, and they wrote to the Judeans about their common heritage during the time of the Maccabees, and which is also preserved not only in those apocryphal records, but in the history of Flavius Josephus. Moving on from the meaning of the word baptism, we can focus on John the Baptist and his students, many of which would later become some of the apostles of Christ. These men did not necessarily understand the specific reason why John immersed men in water. Now John's reasons were in relation to the law and the prophets, but an immersion in water was already a common tradition among Greeks and other kindred peoples at the time, where it was viewed as symbolic for new beginnings and cleansings. This can be seen among the Egyptians in ancient Near Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament by Princeton University Press on pages 437 from an Akkadian inscription and also from 495 from an Egyptian papyrus. It can also be seen in Greek culture in places such as the play Eumenides. All of these cultures viewed water baptism as symbolic for new beginnings and cleansings. So these apostles, they respected the tradition which they had seen in John, but were initially unable to divide its special biblical reasons from the Greco-Roman context that they were familiar with and raised into. Since at least the time of the Seleucids, many Judeans in Judea were Hellenized and familiar with Greek culture, and this is why we see many of the students and apostles of Christ bearing Greek names. These apostles, after becoming students of Christ, retained the tradition of water immersion which they had inherited from him. We see in John's Gospel that the apostles emulated the practice of immersion in the Jordan River, but that Christ himself did not baptize with them. Christ did not immerse anyone with the apostles, because the objectives of water immersion were already accomplished in John through the cleansing of the Lamb's sacrifice and the sons of Levi. Christ explained on several occasions that John immersed with water, but that he himself was going to immerse with fire and the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist is recorded as agreeing in all four Gospels. Going further, Christ said that he had an immersion to be immersed in, that immersion being his death. This is because when Christ died on the cross, the children of Israel were washed in, immersed in, his death. Found dead in body, they are also able to in spirit be raised along with Christ's dead body. This is what Paul spoke of in Romans when he said that those who are immersed are immersed into the death of Christ. This is an immersion which benefited all of Israel regardless of belief or sacrament because those who were sanctified were chosen out in the new covenant to be cleansed from all of their iniquity. Those Israelites who rejected Christ would fall prey to the temporal judgments of the world, such as the fall of Jerusalem, but they were nevertheless sanctified in Christ. No one 
could pluck them from his hand. Eternal salvation is afforded to all the seed of the children of Israel, and if it were not, God would fail. But God does not fail. God keeps his promises. And anyone who says otherwise is a liar. Similar to Paul's remarks concerning immersion in Romans, Peter makes a conscious clarification in his first epistle, noting that in regards to immersion, he was not speaking of the putting away of the filth of the flesh, which would be a water immersion, but of the demand of a good conscience before Yahweh. If we are immersed in Christ, through which we are reconciled to Him in the Spirit, we are obligated also to walk with Him. No man can justify himself according to the law, but if we love Christ, we keep his commandments. All of Israel is cleansed in his death. This is the immersion of Christ, and we see in the early years of the Acts era, the apostles did not immediately realize this, though we see that they realized it later. But until then, some still do practice the water immersion of John such as when Philip immersed the Ethiopian eunuch. Now a short digression concerning that eunuch, just in case it comes up in the comments. Many Judeans had lived in Ethiopia during this time, and especially in the past. Enough so that a model temple was once built there. Similarly, this eunuch had access to scriptures at a time when even Greeks would be stoned if they dared enter into the temple in Jerusalem. Greeks who were physically indistinguishable from Judeans. Being a Judean, this Ethiopian eunuch would have been allowed into and near the temple. He also would have had access to scriptures, and he was obligated under the law to present himself at Jerusalem three times a year, and this is why Philip meets him on the road. So it is important to remember one thing when reading accounts found in the book of Acts, and this is something which our dear friend Clifton Emmeheiser, a great teacher, once taught, and it is true that the book of Acts is a record of the transition from the Old to New Covenant. The apostles, they were not infallible men, neither were they demigods, as some may erroneously want to paint them, but they were students of Christ, just like all of us, though chosen out for a special purpose, but learning and adapting along the way. And we see that the book of Acts even opens with this establishment because we see there that at the time of the ascension of Christ, Luke records that the apostles were expecting Christ to immediately bring forth the kingdom. Because they were still learning in their understanding, they did not yet understand the requirement for two advents of the Messiah. Here in the same passage, Christ also reminds them of another important lesson, which in this video we are exploring the fact that as he says, Johannes immersed in water, but you shall be immersed in the Holy Spirit after not many days hence. Here Christ is speaking in regards to the Pentecost which was the first deposit of the Holy Spirit. We have to remember that John agreed that while he immersed in water, Christ would immerse with the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, the apostles were immersed in the Holy Spirit. Water baptism was a ritual to be left behind with John, one which the apostles do indeed abandon later in Acts, 
because now there is only one baptism, and we will see this, but unfortunately, many assemblies did not similarly leave water baptism behind as the apostles did. As we journey through the book of Acts, we follow the transition of understanding in regards to this immersion of the Holy Spirit first seen at Pentecost. The key moment of this educational journey is found with Peter's experience at the household of Cornelius. Later, Peter, when recounting that specific experience, he says, I remembered the saying of the prince as he spoke, Indeed, Johannes immersed in water, but you shall be immersed in the Holy Spirit. This was not an immersion of water that took place at Cornelius' household, but it was an immersion very similar to the immersion that the apostles experienced during the first Christian Pentecost. This is why Peter recognized it as such. This immersion of the Holy Spirit, which the apostles experienced at Pentecost, was now being experienced by other early Christians, and the words of Christ were becoming increasingly clear for them. Peter, from this point forward, does not maintain water baptism. We don't even see water baptism mentioned in the book of Acts anywhere beyond this point. And we see again in his first epistle that he had to clarify that he was not speaking of the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but of a demand of a good conscience before Yahweh. If we love the Father, we keep his commandments, and if we keep his commandments, he will make an abode with us, and Christ is the Holy Spirit. He will not leave us fatherless. So as we just mentioned, from this point forward in Acts, there is no water immersion, and the apostles, they follow Peter in this evolution of understanding. But we see that it was not widespread among all of the early Christians. So, simultaneously, there were others, such as Apollos, who had not yet evolved their understanding as the others were in the process of doing. So we see, in a principal record of this transition from water baptism to immersion of the Holy Spirit, we see Priscilla and Aquila meeting Apollos, who was only teaching of the immersion of John, and it says they took him aside and they taught him a better way. The better way is the same way Peter experienced at the household of Cornelius. The better way is the way in which Christ had already said to them before his ascension. There is no doubt at all that this explanation which Priscilla and Aquila gave to Apollos was in reference to the fact that John's immersion was done away with, fulfilled, and that the immersion of the Holy Spirit through the death of Christ was now given to the children of Israel. This better way is the understanding which the apostles had received and were now transmitting to others. As the apostles began to understand what Christ had meant regarding immersing with the Holy Spirit and not with water, there is not now two separate immersions competing for recognition. No. The immersion of John, which as we explained, has no use beyond the cleansing of the sacrifice and the cleansing of the sons of Levi. This baptism is not competing for recognition, but was succeeded by and replaced by a more permanent immersion, the death of Christ. This is now the sole relevant immersion from this point forward in the New Testament. And as Paul says, there is one baptism in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5. He explains elsewhere in Romans and in his epistles to the Corinthians that all of Israel had now been immersed into the sacrificial death of Christ, this being that one immersion. Besides this, there is no other. It was this death which allowed the children of Israel to be reconciled to Yahweh 
through the death of the husband, the wife was now released from the penalty of adultery and could once again access the husband through spirit and just as in Adam all die, all in Christ were and are made alive. We see that Paul even attempts to distance himself from water immersion by the time he wrote his first epistle to the Corinthians, no longer seeing it as a relevant ritual. And when Paul returns to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he learns that certain students had not yet heard of the Holy Spirit, and this perplexes Paul. Paul then asks what they were immersed in, because there is no other legitimate thing they could be immersed in. There is no other relevant immersion. So it seems that at the time that Paul meets with these students, that no one had yet come and shown them a better way, as Priscilla and Aquila did for Apollos. But shortly thereafter, hearing Paul's words, they were then immersed in the name of Christ, and the Holy Spirit then came upon them when Paul laid his hands on them. And what do we see then? They began to prophesy and speak in tongues, just as the apostles had done at Pentecost. Here they received that one baptism which Paul spoke of in Ephesians. Additionally, the men in the mountains had already known the immersion of John, and therefore they themselves experienced a similar immersion of the Spirit, especially being in a region lacking water. There is no biblical context for anyone past John to baptize with water, and anyone who tries to teach such falls mute. The idea of immersing proselytes into a new religion with water was not uncommon at the time of the apostles. This is why it was an easy right to lean into for early Christian assemblies who had not yet evolved their understanding. It was also very palpable to a pagan Roman church. And this is how the Pharisees interpreted John's baptism. We have to remember, the Pharisees, they did not ask John what baptism was, because baptism was not a new and strange invention that began with John. But they asked him, who gave him the authority to baptize? Ostensibly asking, because John was not a Pharisee. Historians show us that those Pharisees would baptize foreign proselytes in water who were afterwards, from that point, considered Judeans. And Christ, in the Gospels, he condemned them for these unlawful actions. We of course know that the reason for John's baptism was in no way related to or similar to the objectives of the Pharisees but it was entirely related to the sacrificial rites required for a legitimate offering in Leviticus. But John's baptism is not the church's baptism, and the church's baptism of water is not the immersion of the Holy Spirit which Christ, Paul, Priscilla, Aquila, Peter, and others taught of. The modern so-called churches forsake a biblical understanding and adopt a pharisaical philosophy in its stead. The Assyrians, Egyptians, and even Greeks had similar traditions to the Pharisees, and when the Roman Empire instituted Christianity as an official religion, the misunderstood baptism of John was an easy sacrament for them to adopt alongside with it but they have no basis, and water baptism has no basis in scripture beyond John. As the apostles adapted their understanding, they would also agree with Paul, their brother and kinsman, where he said that, Christ sent me not to immerse, but to announce the good message. Neither should we immerse, but just as Paul did, we should explain to our brethren that they have been immersed in the death of Christ, being the seed of Israel. 
and while the act of water immersion is not sinful, the church has used it as a method to control men for many generations, convincing unaware followers that their salvation is somehow tied to sacraments and pomp. But salvation is not through rituals of the law, and neither is it through fanciful church inventions. Here they succeed at lording over men, exactly as Paul and Peter warned would happen in their epistles, and it is in this which we see the danger and the sin. A bishop who tries to teach a man that his ability to dip him into tap water trumps over the immersion of all the seed of Israel into the blood of Christ is attempting to give himself an authority which belongs only to Christ. Today many Christians need to undertake the same transition which the apostles made 2,000 years ago. Apostolic Christianity was persecuted out of existence to make room for a religion palpable to the Roman Empire, but as Christ told his apostles, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If we search the word as the men of Berea did, we may also understand just how it is that the children of Israel are cleansed in the word. This is the same immersion into the word which Paul wrote of in Ephesians, which the assemblies were washed in. Christians must show initiative to discover the truth of scriptures away from the superstitious doctrines of men. Christianity, it is not form and it is not sacraments, but it is substance and action. All of Israel has been washed in the blood of Christ, and just as in Adam all die, all in Christ will be made alive. Thank you for watching, and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.